Hi, I'm Andrew Levy. I'm a PhD student at the Wellcome Center for Human Neuroimaging. And today I'm going to be providing you with a walkthrough demonstration of MEG and EEG pre-processing using SPM. So the intention of this tutorial is for it to be a follow along walkthrough guide. So there's a number of places you can also find documentation to help provide you some additional details about the steps that we're going to perform today. So the first is contained within the SPM manual. So this tutorial is found in chapter 41. You also can find this tutorial now in a new edition on the SPM online documentation. So there's a new section now relating to tutorials. So let's click on this link to get some additional details about this uh, tutorial. So we can see here that we're going to be dealing with the tutorial relating to the multimodal multi-subject data set. So as the name suggests, there's multiple modalities available as part of this data set. So there's EEG, MEG, fMRI, and structural MRI data available, and it's been uh, performed on multiple subjects. So this tutorial here provides quite a comprehensive re uh, review of the steps you can do analyses using SPM. So starting out with doing pre-processing, doing source reconstruction of your data, and then lastly doing statistical testing of your data. But right now we're just going to be focusing on how to use SPM to do pre-processing. So the first thing you need to do is to get access to the data, and this can be done by using the FTP link here. So I'll just copy this. So in my case, I'm on a PC, so I need to use an FTP client to download the data. So all you need to do is to type, the, put the link into the host name. There's no need for a username or a password. And you can see that I now have access to all the data relating to this data set. So what I recommend that you download is the folder relating to publications, the SPM scripts, and then the data for subject 15. So we're going to follow exactly along with the same data that was used as part of the, the tutorial. So just to note, when we go inside the subjects folder, you can see that we have data relating to the, all the imaging modalities as available as part of this data set. So if you're limited on disk space, just download the data for the MEEG, but it's crucial that you maintain the same parent folder for subject 15 here. Okay, so let's just provide you some brief details about the data set itself. So as mentioned, it's a multimodal data set and we're just concerning ourselves with this EEG and MEG data. So the data was recorded using an Electra vector view system. So this is an MEG system that is composed of 102 magnetometers and 204 planar gradiometers. As part of the same system, you can also record EEG and it contains 70 electrodes. With regards to the experimental protocol, the experiment was concerned with looking at facial processing. So the, de the design is composed of famous faces, unfamiliar faces, and scrambled faces. And as an incidental task, the participants were asked to judge the right and left symmetry of each of the faces. The experiment was run over a total of six sessions, with each session lasting around about 10 minutes. And in total, at the end of this, we have about 300 trials for each of the three condition types. So if you want to get some additional information about this, because this is just a very brief overview, you can find some more detail in the Henson 2011 paper. And I'll show you at a later date, a later point, how you can get access to this paper from what the data we just downloaded from that FTP server. So the main aim of today is I want to show you how you can use SPM to set up a serial pipeline. And this is done by using the SPM batch interface. So what we can do as part of this interface is set up a, a kind of linear serial uh, number of processes and then execute this on our data. And this batch interface is quite convenient because we can apply this to multiple runs of our data and also extend this to multiple subjects. The other point of today is to show you how you can do pre-processing using SPM. And today we're just going to be setting up one particular example of a pre-processing pipeline. It's important to stress this. So you will need to tailor the kind of uh, processes you'll perform in your data specific to the needs of your data and also the types of analyses that you're going to be performing. We'll also show you how you can visualize your data using SPM. So it's always important we have a good understanding of how, how our data is looking, especially when we prefer, you know, apply some sort of process to our data. We need to check to make sure that the outcome is as desired. And then the last thing we'll do is we'll show you how you can generate images of your data for SPM analysis. So statistical testing in SPM takes advantage of random field theory in order to correct for multiple comparisons in our data. And in order for us to take advantage of this, our data needs to be presented in, in image volumes. So a format that's quite similar to fMRI data. 
Okay, so let's talk, touch upon the pre-processing that we're going to do. So I've broken this down into kind of two main themes. The first concern with pre-processing, in which we're trying to amplify the SNR of our data, and then the pre preparation of our data to do evoked analysis. So where we're looking for effects in our data as a function of peristimulus time. So for the pre-processing, the first thing we're going to do is we'll set up a batch to do conversion of our data. So this is where we're going to take our raw data and convert it into a format that SPM uses. We'll also perform some additional steps, uh, which we're terming here as housekeeping. So we want to rename some of the channels. We also want to label some of the channels which are deemed of being poor quality. We'll look at how you can do downsampling of your data and also perform a baseline correction. And the last thing we'll do is we'll perform some housekeeping of our data relating to trying to conserve this space. Once we've done this then for each of the six runs of our data, we then want to look into how we can merge those six runs. So it's convenient for us to have all the data in one space for them so then we can then do evoked analysis. So what we're going to do here is just merging of those six individual runs. We'll then look at doing a step that's specific to EEG data called re-referencing, in which we're going to subtract a global average of our data in order to uh, amplify local differences between channels. And then the last thing we'll do as part of this step is to reorder the uh, order in which the conditions are labeled in our data set. So at a later point, we're going to be forming contrast of our data to look at differential effects. And so it's convenient for us to set the order that it then becomes easier to define these contrast vectors. So that'll be everything that we'll do in terms of pre-processing. And then we're going to move on to doing evoked analyses or setting things up for evoked analyses of our data. So what we're going to do, we'll crop the data. So we're going to re refine the epochs over which we're going to look for e uh, events, um, differential effects in our data. We'll then perform a, a type of artifact detection. And we're going to stress that this is a very lightweight way to perform artifact detection of our data. So SPM has more sophisticated uh, algorithms at your disposal. But this is just uh, one example of how to identify blinks in our data. But I would recommend looking in the SPM manual if you're interested in looking at more sophisticated ways to detect artifacts. We're then going to perform a step that's specific to planar gradiometers. So planar gradiometers are gradiometers which are composed of two orthogonal channels, so detecting the magnetic field in two orthogonal directions. So that means for every channel and every time point, we have this vector value data. And in order for kind of ease of trying to do statistical testing, we'll go through a step which we're going to collapse that vector value data down to a single scalar value. We'll then perform some trial averaging such that we can see across uh, time in the scout uh, how the, the processing of the uh, different conditions look like. And then lastly, as part of the step, we'll do some contrast of these trial averages to amplify the um, uh, differential effects of our experiment. Then the last step we're, is going to do is going to generate these volumes of our data. So as I mentioned, we want to do some statistical testing on our data. And in order to do that for SPM, we need to convert our data from being in channel space into these volumes in which we are interpolating across the scalp. And then we'll have a third dimension relating to time. OK, so I've moved over to MATLAB. Before we get started with uh, firing up SPM, let's have a quick look at some of the files and folders that we'll need to interact with. So first, let's have a look at the data. So here's the subject 15 folder that we've just downloaded from the FTP server. And you can see in my case, I've downloaded the data from all the different modalities, but we only need to focus on the MEEG data today. So we can see that we've got data pertaining to all the six runs from the experiment and that for each run, we have two data files, one that has the suffix underscore raw and another that has the underscore triple S. So the triple S data is data in which a pre-processing step has been applied to the raw data. It's called max filtering, and this is a spatial denoising process. And it's with this data that we're going to be applying our pre-processing steps to. Uh, another file to look out for is the bad underscore channels. So in the case of this data set, an expert has gone through all of the MEG and EG data, has reviewed all the channels, and has labeled for us the channels which are deemed as being poor. A separate folder here for trials. So again, someone for us has compiled uh, a matrix that gives details about all the events that have occurred in the experiment. So for the three condition types, we've got times relating to when they occurred for that data set. And we're going to be using this to epoch our data. Let's have a look at some of the other folders we've downloaded. So I've also downloaded the uh, publications folder from the FTP server. 
and we can see we've got uh, some useful publications you might want to refer to if you want some extra information and also the SPM manual if that isn't readily, readily available for you. I've also downloaded the SPM scripts folder. So this contains uh, pre-made batch uh, scripts that have been saved. So essentially for this tutorial, we're going to be replicating uh, a subset of these batch processes. So the ones that relate to pre-processing of the MEEG. So these might be useful to refer to. So if when you're following along, you're getting errors and you can't identify what's causing the problem, it'd probably be useful to refer to these as a first call, just to cross check to see where your error may be. And also along the way, we're gonna be generating images to review the processing steps that we performed. And we should be essentially in, aligned with the, these images that are generated from the same batch processes. And in my case, I've generated a new folder called batch scripts. So as we're creating these batches, we're going to be uh, saving them so that we can call them at a later date or applying to different subjects. So it's always useful to save these in a dedicated folder. So it's easier for reference. And then lastly, we've got the SPM uh, toolbox. So in my case, I've just added it to this folder. But in your case, you may have it in a different location, but it's important to know where you've got this located because the first thing that we need to do is we need to add the SPM toolbox to the MATLAB path. So in my case, because it's in the current folder, all I need to type in is SPM 12. But in your case, if it's located somewhere else, just type in the full address. And this now has been added to the path so we can see that it's no longer grayed out. So now we're ready to uh, start SPM. So SPM has two main modalities uh, of operation. So for fMRI or MEEG. So obviously in our case, we're interested in working with EEG data. So we just type in SPM space EEG. And this is now gonna load up e the SPM toolbox uh, and configure specifically for EEG analysis. Okay, so this is loaded up now and you should be presented with three panels. So let's just give a quick overcap of what uh, these panels are used for. So the first is the menu. And we can see we're presented with, uh, at the first kind of upper half, a kind of typical processing pipeline we may go through from the kind of beginning to end in terms of doing, you know, processing of our data, doing source reconstruction, setting up a, a GLM for at the first and second level, and then looking at the results of these uh, GLMs, you know, our kind of hypothesis testing. And then in the lower half, we have some general utility functions. So these are often used to be able to kind of review our data or sometimes being able to do kind of manipulations of our data that might be used for other types of analyses. Then in the lower panel here, we have the interactive panel. So if we're inter setting up kind of uh, SPM processes and functions using this menu, it's often required to provide additional information such as the location of our data, or if we want to change things from the, from the default setting. And you'll get prompts appearing in this window that you can then uh, alter these settings. This panel is also used to indicate the progress. So when a process is running, a progress bar will appear here and we can just see that SPM is ticking along nicely and how far away we are from, from completion. And then in this bigger, larger panel in the middle, we have the, the graphics panel. So once we've applied a pro some sort of process to our data, it's obviously good practice to then review our data to make sure that it has been applied as intended. And typically we will use this panel to display the outcome of a pre-processing step or when you're in the later stages of doing analysis to look at, at the consequences of our hypothesis testing. Okay, so let's get started with creating our first batch pipeline. So we can do this by opening up the batch editor. So we click on the batch button. Then we get presented with a new interface uh, called the batch editor. So this batch editor contains a number of windows that I'll just quickly provide you an overview with. So the first one is the module list. So this provides you a list of the modules that we're gonna be adding to our pipeline. And crucially, it's gonna be presented in the serial order in which those processes will be applied to your data. Each time we add a new job, the settings for that module will be presented in this window here. So often there'll be the case there's some missing required piece of information and we can provide that information by interacting with this window. And also if we want to change any of the default settings, we'll do so by using this window. In the bottom part here, we have an inbuilt user guide. So you'll often be provided with some kind of summary brief information about the process and what some of the settings do. We have a ribbon here in which we can load up, uh, or in this case here, start a new batch 
we can load up a previously saved batch. We can save the current batch. And right now we have a grayed out play button. So the play button will always be grayed out whenever the current pipeline isn't in a situation ready to run. So that's typically due to there being kind of missing piece of information. So let's now add in our first job. So the first thing we want to do is we want to convert the data from its raw format into a format that's used by SPM. So we can access this module by going into the MEG submenu and then finding the conversion module. So we can see that now that we've got this job, it's listed in our module list. And then we also have the settings for that module in this window here as well. Crucially, we can see that there's a field here, a file name that has an X and an arrow mark next to it. And that's also mirrored in the module list here. So this is demarking that there is some uh, missing required information. So what this is wanting is wanting the location of our raw data that we want to convert. So we can specify this by clicking on the specify button and then loading up the run 01 SS data. So the raw data that's already had a max filter applied to it. And we click on done. And we can see that now our location has been provided to the batch process. So we can see that that X, you know, that required information has now been completed. And so it's disappeared from the module list. And that's also now mirrored in the fact that this uh, play button has gone from gray to green. So this is now in a situation where the batch could be run. But right now we're interested in changing some of the default settings of the, of the conversion process and also adding some additional jobs to our pipeline. So in terms of changing the default settings for this conversion process, the first thing we want to do is to change the read mode. So at the moment it's loading up the continuous data and it's going to convert the entire data into this new SPM format. But as is often the case with MEG and EG data due to the high sampling rates that you know, it can take up a lot of our disk space. So where possible, we want to try and, and conserve disk space. So the first thing we can do here is just by loading up epochs of our data. And what we're going to do is just be loading epochs that relate to time windows in which we know, we know events from our experiments are occurring. So we can change this by changing the read mode and changing it to epochs. So what SPM now requires is information about when these events are occurring in our data. So we're going to provide this information through the use of that trial file. So that child file I showed you previously. And then we will point to the location using the specify button. And we go into trials. And then we're going to click on run01 trialdef.mat. Great. So we're also going to change the channel selection again in order to try and conserve some disk space. We're only going to be doing analysis on the MEG and EEG data. So let's just limit the conversion to those the data types. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to delete the selection for all channels. And then we're going to select by channel type. And we're just going to click on this three times. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to load up the EEG data, then the MEG planar gradiometers, and then the MEG magnetometers. Okay, so that's everything that we want to change uh, on the default settings. But I just want to point out this output file name field, field here. So SPM by default, what it will do, it will uh, rename the converted file into SPM MEG, sorry, SPM EEG underscore. So if for some reason you want to change that default setting, you can do so by specifying here and, and changing it to whatever name you desire. Okay, so, so the next thing we want to do now is we want to add a new job to this uh, pipeline. And what we want to do now is just to do some housekeeping. So we can do this by using the prepare module. So we'll find this in the MEG preprocessing uh, submenu, and then we're going to select prepare. So this is the main housekeeping module. Okay, that's not appeared in our module list. So let's select this. And we can see we've now, we now got some new settings that we need to provide this module with. So the first thing that this module requires is the location of the data that we want to apply this housekeeping to. So whereas previously we pointed to something that's on our file path, right now what we want to do, we want, we want to link this process to the output of the previous step, output of the conversion. And we can do so by using the dependency button. So when we click on this, we're now prevent, provided with a, a list of jobs that precede this current module, precede the housekeeping. So at the moment, obviously, we only have one job that we've set up. 
uh, becomes uh, previous to this uh, housekeeping. So let's keep, click on that. And so now what we've done is we've linked this current module with the output of the previous process. So the first thing we're going to do is we want, in terms of housekeeping, we want to rename some channels. So we can do so by using the new set channel type task. And so we're doing this because some of the EEG electrodes uh, were used to record eye movements. Uh, one other was used to record ECG, and there was another that was uh, a free floating electrode. So we're going to relabel it by using this set channel type uh, task here. So the first thing to keep an eye out for, this is often the case, whenever there is a channel selection setting, it will default to all the channels. And it's often the case that whatever we're doing is going to be applied to a subset of channels. So it's always useful to keep an eye out that we, you know, we need to delete this all selection. And so in the case right now, the first uh, channels that we're going to relabel are the channel, EG channels that we use to record EOG. So there were two channels that were used to record uh, for EOG. So we're going to go to new custom channel and we're going to click on that twice. So the first channel that was used for EOG was EEG061. And the other one was EEG062. And then we use this field here to relabel those two channels. So we're going to relabel that as EOG. Okay, so we're now going to repeat this for the channels that we use for ECG. So we go back up to select task and then new set channel type. Again, first thing to do, delete this all select all channel selection, new custom channel. It will be EEG063. And we'll re relabel this as ECG. And then lastly, again, we'll select another new set channel type, delete all the channels, and we're going to relabel the free floating electrode, so EEG064, and keep that renaming as other. Okay, so that's the first bit of housekeeping we want to do. The next thing we want to do is to take the uh, bad channels file, so that file that was uh, generated by an expert reviewer who's told us in advance the channels which he deemed as being of poor quality. So again, we, we're going to do this by selecting a new task. And we're going to go for the option that is set unset bad channels. And same as briefly prior, you know, the first thing we want to do is we're going to delete applying this to all our channels. You know, we definitely don't want to be labeling all our channels as bad. And we're going to demark our bad channels by using a file. So this new channel file. And then we want to point to the location of that file. So in our case, it's this bad underscore channels dot mat. So it's important to stress at this point that, you know, this data set has you know, the benefit of having an expert reviewer, but it's often the case, you know, we, we don't have that sort of thing to hand. And so there are certain, you know, specific functions, artifact retention functions within SPM that can be used to label you know, identified channels which are of poor quality. Okay, so that's everything we want to do with regards to housekeeping. The next thing we want to do now is to downsample our data. So we'll add this module, go to SPM, MEEG, then the pre-processing, and then downsampling. And same as the previous step, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to link the output of the previous step to this current new module using the dependency button. Great. So just to say, the reason why we're down sampling, so the current uh, data set is being sampled at 1000 hertz. And for the evoked an analysis that we're going to be doing, the highest frequency that's been deemed of interest is 100 hertz. So we're therefore licensed to downsample our data in order to conserve this space. And we're going to downsample to 200 hertz because usually the minimum sampling rate is twice that of the highest frequency of interest. So we do so by just by providing the new sampling rate. And, there, and that's all the settings now for the downsampling setup. And then another bit of pre-processing we want to do is to do some baseline correction. I'm going to do this by applying the baseline correction module here. 
And same as before, first thing we need to do is to link it to the output of the previous step. Great. And now we need to provide the pre-stimulus uh, window over which we want to take the average to apply the baseline correction. So here we're going to take 100 milliseconds before the stimulus onset. And then that will then be used as the baseline window. Great. So that's everything in terms of processes that we want to apply to our data. But we're just going to add an additional step here of deleting some files. So the way SPM works, each you know, process it applies to a data, it will generate a new file. And what it will do, it will add a prefix to that data, and that information is usually provided in this window. So all these intermediary files that's generated from the conversion and the housekeeping and downsampling isn't going to be used after, you know, in any sort of subsequent analyses. So in order to conserve this space, we, what we can do right now is just delete the output of those files. So we'll delete everything up to and excluding the baseline correction. So we do this by going into the MEG submenu, going into the other, and then using the delete module. And then all we need to do is just point to the file that we want to delete. Again, using the dependency button. So the first one we'll delete is the output of the conversion process. And then we're just gonna replicate this twice and then just change this to capture the outputs of the housekeeping and the output of the downsampling. So that's everything we want to do now in terms of this first batch pipeline. So if we wanted to, we could click the play button and it would apply this batch process to this first run of data. But as we know, we've got six runs. And so what would be more useful at this stage is, is to have a, a way to set up this batch for all the six runs. And we can do this by saving the batch and also generating a script, which will help us fill in the uh, information that is run specific. So before I do that, I'm just going to go back and I'm actually going to delete some of the fields which would be deemed as run specific. So these are the fields related to loading up the raw data for each run and also the trial definition and also the bad channels. Great. So we're going to save this now and we're going to put this in that dedicated batch scripts folder. I'm going to call this one batch underscore preproc convert. What we can see happen is we now get this new script that auto opens in the MATLAB batch editor. And what it's requiring is the files which are deemed as being run specific. So before we go into filling this in, I just want to show you you know, that they, how this uh, script is operating. So the, you can see that the output of saving this is, has generated two files. So we've got the batch prepart convert, the one that we're viewing now in the editor, and another one called batch prepart convert job. So this one contains all of the settings that are going to be used to run the process. And you can see contained within there, there's some fields that are labeled as undefined. So these are the fields that I just deleted that are essentially specific to each run. So this script here, what it's going to do, it's going to load up that jobs file, and it's also going to fill in those undefined uh, placeholders for each specific run. So what we need to do now is provide the script with some, some additional information detailing the number of runs that there were, and just also providing the necessary file paths. So in our case, we had six runs. And I'm also now going to provide the locations of the file paths. So I'm just copying and pasting this over from the online documentation. So we can see now, so for the raw data, it, we're, it's pointing to the raw path, and we, we'll provide this quite shortly, looking at subject 15, the MEG data, and then the uh, match filtered data. Same goes for the trial information. We can see that this um, kind of placeholder here that's going to be used to change and uh, adapt for each run and then the uh, matrix used for identifying the bad channels. So let's now just also just provide the parent path. Okay, so obviously that will be specific to your own uh, directory. 
And the last thing I'm going to do is also, I'm just going to change the directory. So SPM typically by default will save in the current directory. So it's just good practice that you change to the folder, you know, in which you're loading the data from. So we can see now what this is going to do, it's going to load up all the data for the six runs and apply that batch process we just saved to all that data. It's also just useful to take note at this point as well. You can see how this can easily be extended to applying this to uh, multiple subjects. So let's save this now with the updated information. And we can now press run from within the MATLAB editor, and it will, will apply that new process, this batch process to this run data. Okay, so that batch process is now completed. So let's just have a look at the outputs of that process. So moving over to the subject data folder, we can see we have some new files now. We've got these SPM EEG formatted data with the prefix B and D. So this demarcates that we've done some baseline correction and downsampling of this data. And we'll notice that for <coughs> each of the six runs, we've got two file types. We've got this dot dat and dot mat. So these are both referring to the same data. So the dot mat, it contains header and meta information, and the dot dat is the actual data itself in this dedicated SPM format. So we've applied some pre-processing steps to our data. So it's always good practice to review the outputs of that of our data, you know, kind of visually inspect it, just to make sure that everything has proceeded as intended. So we can do so, we can look at our data by using the dedicated MEG uh, review panel. So we'll find this under this, the display tab and then selecting MEEG. So right now we're just gonna focus on the first run and then we'll load this up. And we can see now that that graphics tab now becomes dedicated for reviewing MEG and EEG data. So when it loads up, we will default by landing on the info panel. And this will provide us with kind of some meta information at the top here. And then lower down, we have some additional tabs to kind of review aspects of our data. So when it first loads up, we'll be on the history panel. This provides us information about the SPM functions that have previously been applied to this data. So right now it's just gonna exactly mirror everything that we had set up as part of that batch process. So going through converting, relabeling our channels, marking channels as bad, downsampling and baseline correcting. And we can see actually the functions that were called uh, to, you know, to perform these steps. So just as a quick aside, we've got this option here called save a script. So this is an alternate way that we can uh, set up pipelines using SPM. So let's just quickly have a, a review of this. So we'll click on this and then I'll save in my batch scripts, a file called function preproc convert. It's gonna provide us the ability to choose which of those previous steps we want to include in this new pipeline. So for now, let's just select all of the previous steps and then we'll load this up. So what we can see now is we have a new script and what this is doing, it's calling the uh, the SPM function that we use as part of that uh, pro the pre-processing pipeline explicitly. So as we go through, we can see we've got the conversion, the channel relabeling, the downsampling and the baseline correction. So having the calling the functions in such a fashion can be quite a, a powerful way to customize pipelines to our needs. So you can imagine certain circumstances, let's say for instance, you, you've kind of created your own pre-processing step and you want to interleave this with the current SPM functions, we can just you know, very easily add this to this script, applying it in, you know, in the correct location. Or you may find there's uh, certain times where an SPM function, you know, a pre-processing step takes quite a long time to run. And so we want to take advantage of MATLAB's parallel processing. So all we need to do would be wrap one of these functions in a parallel for loop and hopefully then you will kind of quicken up that pre-processing step. Like I said, this is quite useful at a later stage when you become more familiar with SPM and interacting with these functions and you can you know, tailor these pipelines to your own needs. So let's go back to reviewing the data set. So moving along, we have this inversion tab here. So this relates to looking at uh, when we've applied source reconstruction to our data. So we haven't done this as of yet, so there's nothing to look at here for now. We have this trials tab. This provides us information about the event markings that have been attached to our data set. So we can see now we have events relating to our three condition types, the unfamiliar, famous, and scrambled, and that we have the onset times of these events. There's also just another column to keep an eye out for here is the bad column. So at a later point, we're going to go through a kind of artifact detection process 
And if any of these kind of artifacts occurred during a bad trials, you may notice that some of these trials then get marked as bad. And that means they're not going to be included in any sort of averaging or future statistical analyses. We also can review our channel types. So as we did right at the start with our conversion process, we have limited the data set to just our MEG and EEG data. So we can see all our channels relate to the MEG and EEG channels. So the rest of these tabs now relate to actually visually inspecting our data. So let's just go through these in order. The first one we have here is other. So we can use this to review the auxiliary channels. So in our case, we have some channels that we relabeled re to capture EOG, ECG, and that floating electrode. And we can clearly see here, we've got some ECG events happening in our data. We have this tab here called MCOM. So this is magnetometers combined. This is going to become relevant at a later stage when we've applied an additional processing step to our planar gradiometers. But right now, there's nothing to see here. So here we have the MEG planar gradiometers. And we can see that the what data there relating to each of the trials. Also for our MEG magnetometers. And then lastly, for our EEG data. So like I said, we, we, we have epoched our data. So if we want to review kind of visually inspect our individual epochs, we can do so using this window over here. We can also zoom in on our data here in the time domain. And then here, just in terms of enlarging the amplitude scale of our data or reducing the scale, and then having the magnifying glass just to focus in on certain parts of our data. We also have here the ability to review our data in terms of scout, but right now, because we're looking at just individual trials, our data is quite noisy. So it's not going to be all that informative right now, but we'll come back to this once we've generated our evoked responses. But just say so, this is a, obviously a useful way to visually inspect our data. And you know, some people may want to kind of visually inspect things trial by trial. And if you were finding certain trials were bad, you can do that. You, know, you can mark your trials bad at this stage by clicking on this button here. We can see that this trial now has been now marked as bad. But often we're going to do, you know, do sort of like uh, bad trial detection algorithmically using these SPM functions, and we'll quickly go over that at a later stage. Great. So let's now carry on with our pre-processing. Let's set up a new batch. So we'll go back into the batch editor. So what we're interested in doing now, so we've applied some pre-processing to our six runs individually. But for our subsequent analysis in which, in which we're looking at evoked responses, we're not interested in any sort of intersessional effects. So what's going to be more convenient here is to combine those six runs into one data set. So we can do so by using the merging pre-processing step found here. And so the first thing we need to do is point SPM to the six runs that we're going to combine. So found in the data set folder here, the SPM formatted data, just load up the six individual rooms. OK, great. So for everything else, we're going to keep that to the default. So the other thing we want to do at this stage is uh, a pre-processing step that's specific to EG data. So we're going to do some re-referencing, in which we subtract a global average from the data in order to kind of amplify local differences between the channels. So this is a two-step process. So the first thing we need to do is create a matrix, which is going to capture the average of our channels. And we'll do this, first of all, by using the prepare module, the housekeeping module. And so first thing we'll do, we'll link this to the previous step. And then the task we're going to select is the create average reference montage. So like I say, what this is going to do, it's going to create a matrix which uh, essentially captures the average of our electrodes. So we just keep a note of the output of this here. It's called average ref montage.mat. So just before we move on to applying this uh, montage to our data, there's just an additional step of housekeeping that we're going to do. So at the moment, the order in which the conditions are labeled in our data is going to be the order in which they occurred in the experiment itself. So in the next step, we're going to create some contrast of our data to look at like differential effects between our conditions. And so it's going to be convenient that we set the order in a fashion so it's going to make it easier to specify that contrast vector. So we can do this by clicking on the sort conditions option. And we're going to specify a conditions list. So we're going to do this three times for the three different condition types and then set the order in our desired fashion. So we're going to go in the order of famous
unfamiliar. And then lastly, scrambled. Okay, great. So what we do now, we're going to go back to applying this average reference as a montage to our data. And so what we need to do now is call up the montage module found in pre-processing. And you can see now there are two files that we need to fill in for this montage module. First being the actual data itself. So we'll just link that to the previous step. So this prepared data file. And then the other thing what's now is the actual montage file. So again, it will be an output from the previous step, but the average ref reference montage field. And another important thing we need to change it is the default setting. So at the moment, is if we just apply this now, it's going to discard the, the MEG data. So we want to make sure that we keep all the data for future analysis. That's great. So that's everything we want to do now as part of this second batch. So what we're going to do is to save this. Sorry, need to do the save batch and script. And we'll call this batch preproc merge. And again, this will auto open here. So because I've filled in all the missing pieces of information, it hasn't provided us the kind of the inputs, you know, where it wants the kind of placeholders for the missing piece of information. But we're going to just call, you know, run this process through the batch header itself, just to so we can move along a bit quicker. But in your case, if you wanted to uh, set this up using the scripts process, you do the same thing as previously, in which you would delete these files. So let's run this now. OK, so that merging batch process is now completed. So let's just have a look at the output of that process in our file. So we can see we have this file now called mcbdspmeeg, demarcating that we've done applied a montage to our data and that we've also merged across our runs. So all those six runs is now converted into just one single file. So as I mentioned previously, it's all good practice just to review the output of that data, you know, the output of that process. So let's call up the MEG review panel again and loading up the output of that of that batch process. And so we can see now in that history tab, we've now got those steps from that previous batch process now appended into this file. And just to note that we've not brought forward the previous uh, function calls because we've got this now new merged file. So you can, in your own time, just review these additional panels. You know, in particular, you might want to look at the EEG just to see the consequences of this applying this new montage. But for now, let's now move on with our processing pipeline. So what we're concerned with doing now is generating some evoked responses. So we'll go back into the batch script, batch editor. And uh, we're going to now do a series of steps uh, such that we're going to have these ERPs that we can then do statistical testing on. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to crop our data. So even though the data has already been epoched, we're going to refine that epoching to a time window of interest. So we'll go into preprocessing step and we're going to select crop. So first thing to do is let's load up this merged data file. So the MCBDM SPM EG and then select the time window we want to reduce this data from. So what we're interested in is looking at 100 milliseconds before stimulus onset and 800 milliseconds after. And just to note that if you were kind of doing time frequency analysis, you know, if you've already converted your data into time frequency data and you wanted to crop also the frequency space, you could do so uh, using this crop function. And we're going to apply this uh, cropping to all of our channels. So we'll just leave that as is. So the next thing we're going to do now is just want to just very briefly touch upon how to do artifact detection using SPM. So there are multiple functions that can do this, but for right now, we're just going to do a very lightweight, uh, easy process of, of kind of trying to capture when eye blinks occurred in our data set. So for this, we're going to use the artifact detention module. So first thing, let's link it to the previous step. 
and then we need to tell uh, SPM what's the uh, kind of process that we want to use to detect artifacts in our data. So as I mentioned, what we're interested in right now is trying to ca capture blinks in our data. So let's select a new method. And we're going to remove the all channel selection, and we're going to just select the channels that we're capturing the EOG, so the eye movements. So select channel by type, and then select the EOG channels. And then becomes the detection algorithm. So we can see there are numerous SPM functions to capture artifacts in our data. But right now, we're just going to use a very simple threshold test. So any time this EOG channel is above a certain threshold, it's going to be marked as being an artifact. And we'll set that threshold at 200 microvolts. So what's going to happen now is each time that EOG channel exceeds 200 microvolts, you're going to get a, a, a kind of time window around that period of one second being marked as bad. And also just to note at this point, we also have this setting here of the bad channel threshold. So what this does is if more than 20% of the trials for that channel are marked as bad, then the whole channel will be marked as bad. Just kind of giving you a slight inkling of how you can use SPM also to detect bad channels in your data, rather than having to rely on an expert or, or visual inspection. So the next thing we're going to do now is to deal with something specific to this MEG data set. So we've got these uh, planar gradiometers. And what we want to do is to reduce that uh, data down to a single vector. So let me just load this up. So the combined plane map. So planar gradiometers, uh, what they do is that each channel has two gradiometers that are pointing in orthogonal directions. This can be quite useful for looking at kind of different sources of electrophysiology. But when it comes to doing kind of looking at event responses at the kind of kind of sensor level, it's often typical to reduce that vector value down to a single scalar value. And so we'll do that using this combined planar module. In which it does, it converts these two vector values down to a single magnitude value. So taking the root mean squared of those two, um, two values. So let's link it to the previous step. And then we are going to replace the, uh, the vector value data with this new magnitude value data here. OK, great. And then we're now in a situation that we're now ready to create some averaged evoked responses. So we're going to move to the averaging submenu and then select averaging. So let's link this to the previous step. And then for now, we're going to use a standard process of averaging. So just taking the average across channels, but it's important to note there's an also an additional option to do robust averaging. So this is a weighted procedure. So it looks at data points and weights them as a function of how far they are from, from the median at that time point. So it's quite a good way to kind of do a, 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 like I say, a weighted process in which we downweight outliers of our data. So this is quite useful when we have different numbers of trials between our condition types or we're dealing with particularly uh, noisy data. However, that option takes quite a, a while to run. So just to keep things moving along quickly, We'll stick to just classic averaging. Now, what we're going to do next is just to more for kind of visual inspection uh, purposes, we're going to create contrasts of these average responses. So again, we'll find this in the averaging submenu and then contrast over epochs. So this is going to allow us to look at comparisons between the different events event types in our data set. But the first thing to do here is well, actually we're going to pass forward the three uh, conditions independently, such that we have all the conditions and their contrasts all in one data set. So let's select a new contrast. I'm just going to do this three times. And then what we need to do now is provide it with a vector. So this is um, a kind of a vector with respect to our condition types. So one, zero, zero, one means that we're just selecting the famous faces. So we'll call this condition famous. And then we'll do zero, one, zero, meaning that we're only passing forward the unfamiliar faces. And then the last one for this is to just select the scrambled faces. Uh, 
And then next, we're going to do some actual contrast between our condition types. So I'm just going to add two more. So the first contrast we'll do, let's do a comparison, a, a contrast between faces and scrambled. So we'll take the average of the, um, the famous and unfamiliar faces and subtract the scrambled face. And so we'll call this contrast face versus scrambled. And then we'll also do a contrast between the two face types. So do a contrast between the famous and unfamiliar faces. So that would be one, minus one, zero. And so we'll call that famous versus unfamiliar. Great, so that's everything we want to do at this stage to generate these evoked responses. So let's just save this batch. But same as before, I'm just going to do this by running things through the batch editor itself, just so we can move along a little bit quicker. So let's run this. OK, so that processing where we've generated these event responses has now completed running. So let's take a look at our data folder. You see this has now generated uh, a number of new data folders. But the one we're particularly interested in right now is the WMPAP. So this is where we've created these contrasts of our condition types. So let's take a look at this, uh, the output of this in the MEG review panel. We'll load this up. So again, taking a look at our history, we see now it's appended these additional steps of cropping, detecting artifacts, uh, compiling the planar gradiometers, averaging, and then computing this contrast. So let's look at what's changed with respect to our data. So the first thing we can look at is this MCOMB. So this is the combined planar gradiometers. And we see now we have this magnitude value data. So this data will never be negative or uh, zero. Um, this presents its own unique challenges in terms of statistics, but it's in any case one way in which we can uh, collapse that vector value data. So moving on, let's have, take a look at the EEG data. So we can see now with this uh, averaged data, we've got these nice crisp ERPs happening in, in peristimulus time. And so we can you know, zoom in on this data. We can look at this for the different condition types. And what's often more convenient when we're trying to look at differential effects between our conditions is to do this uh, looking at it in terms of the scalp. So if we click this scalp radio button here you will then get these line plots in which the plots are placed in reference to where the, the electrode is in, in, in reference to the scalp. And so let's just load up the three condition types, first of all. So the familiar, sorry, famous, unfamiliar, and scrambled. And then we can just enlarge these slightly. So we can see now that um, we have uh, line plots all across the scalp. So we're just gonna focus, look at a particular channel in the back, so clicking on the zoom button, we will look at a channel around the right posterior. And we can see now we've got this zoomed in um, look in at our evoked responses at peristimulus time for this particular channel, so in, in electrode EEG 070. And what we can see is that there is some indications of differential effects between the, the faces and the scrambled face, in particular around this 200, 300 millisecond window, but also starts, starts to become evident around 160 milliseconds. So fairly typical for uh, facial pr uh, processing. So let's have a look at other ways we can view our data. So the other thing here is to look at our contrasts. So we created this contrast of face and scrambled. So let's see how this looks. So we can see now again in this posterior area here, just reflecting what we were just discussing, 
we have these differential effects present, you know, starting around 160 milliseconds and increasing uh, as we go later on into the um, neural processing. It's also often useful to look at snapshots of the electrophysiology uh, where we kind of interpolated over the scalp and we can do so using this option here. And so we can scan through in peristimulus time looking at um, the spatial topography. So as we said, it seems to be something crucially starting at around 160 milliseconds. And we can see that that's manifesting here where we have this bilateral uh, dipping polarity uh, relating to facial processing. So we can just scan through to getting a better understanding and feeling for our data. Let's also just briefly do this for the MEG um, magnetometers. Again, we can see we have more channels available. And let's have a look at the scalp topography. So you can see here, we've got a slightly different view of the scalp topography reflecting the fact that we're now looking at the magnetic field rather than you know, electrical evoke responses over the scalp. So again, let's have a look at that kind of 160, 170 milliseconds. And we can see we have this kind of posterior electrophysiology that particularly has a kind of right component to it. And then let's do the same for the combined radiometers. Again, picking up some slight differences at this 170 milliseconds around that, that posterior area of the scalp. Okay, great. So that's so you know, creating this contrast, like I say, is quite useful for visual purposes. But what we're often interested in doing is you know, performing statistical analysis on our data. So with SPM, we do statistical analysis um, on images so that we can take advantage of random field theory to correct for multiple comparisons. So that's the standard that was you know, developed for uh, fMRI hypothesis testing. And it's the same uh, approach that we've developed for image and EEG analysis. So what we need to do is convert our data into images. So let's go back to the batch. And we're going to select the module images and convert to images. So what we need to do now is select the uh, file name. Uh, so we, we need to make sure I get the right one here. So it's the one named PAPM. Great. And there's multiple uh, modes in which we can do this conversion to images. So because we're doing evoked analysis, we're going to create images which are scalp by time. So it's going to create a, a 3D image in which the first two dimensions is the kind of X and Y coordinates in reference to space. So, you know, creating this kind of flattened space of this of the kind of scalp geometry and then having this third dimension of time. So the Z dimension will reflect the, where we are in peristimulus time. So we're going to do this for all our conditions individually. So let's just do this three times. So starting off with the famous. Unfamiliar. And then scrambled. And right now we're only going to do this for our EEG channels but it would make sense to apply this separately for the EEG and MEG channels. Great. And we're happy just to keep the entire time window. So remember we previously cropped this, so we're gonna pass forward from 100 milliseconds prior to stimulus onset to 800 milliseconds post stimulus onset. And because we're not doing any sort of frequency analysis as well, we're happy just to leave that on the default setting. Okay, so let's uh, 
The last thing we want to change is just the directory prefix. So because we've got different modalities in this case, it's just important just that we are clear that this is going to be the EEG data. So we'll call this EEG underscore image. And then it's going to create a new folder with these uh, image volumes contained within them. So let's run this now. Okay, so that image generation process is now completed. So let's take a look at what's changed in our data folder. You can see that we now have a new folder called EEG underscore IMG and also appended with the SPMEG file that we use to generate these images. Taking a look inside, we can see that we've generated uh, three uh, nifty volumes, one relating to the three condition types. So if we want to now review these volumes, we can do so using SPM. And again, we'll go to the display drop-down menu, and we're going to this time be using the images review panel. And so loading it this up, we, we need to select the volume that we want to review. What's important to note that these volumes are 4D nifty files. So the first three dimensions relate to the uh, sort of conversion process that we did. So the first two dimensions is going to be in space. So these X, Y coordinates over the scalp, that Z dimension relating to peristimulus time. And then the fourth dimension is going to be the trial number. So at the moment in this frames box, it's got the number one entered there. So what we're showing is just the first frame, the first trial for all of these volumes. So if we want to have a look at different trials, we can uncollapse these volumes just by entering inf into this frame selector. And you can now see that we have access to all the different trial numbers available within that volume. So let's just follow along with the tutorial. Let's take a particular look at the unfamiliar faces at trial 296. So that we're now then presented with the ability to look at this image, both in terms of scalp and perisimilis time. Before we just take a look at that in greater detail, let's just change the color scheme. So the gray map kind of color scheme isn't too useful for electrophysiology data. So let's change this to jet just to extenuate the polarity of the data. And so we can see now we have this scalp projection in which we can move about over the scalp to look for effects. And then in this projection up here, we're able to move right and left over the scalp and then up and down changes in terms of peristimulus time. And then on this other projection here, we're able to move uh, front and back of the scalp and then also in terms of peristimulus time. We can also use these options here to enter, to kind of go to specific locations in our volumes. So let's go to 170 milliseconds. And what we can see with this trial that we have that kind of defined uh, negative polarity in that kind of uh, visual kind of posterior region here. So we've generated these images. So you're now well set up to perform statistical testing on these volumes, and you'll be covering this in uh, a different demonstration. Just before I leave you there, I just want to show you uh, one last thing in terms of what can be done with batch processing. So I'll just go to the parent folder here. So as we called at the start, I downloaded this SPM scripts folder from the FTP server. And you can see we have this script here called master script. So what's been done as part of this master script, it's combining the multiple steps that is required uh, to analyze your data. So going from you know, the, the initial steps of converting and pre-processing to the final steps of doing statistical testing and reviewing those results is all contained within one script here. So what essentially has been done is taking those separate batch scripts and entering it into one compiled master script. So once you get familiar with playing around with you know, the batch processing, I'd recommend referring to this master script just to learn how to get everything into one space, such that it's gonna be easier and you know, more convenient uh, to kind of apply SPM to your data sets. Okay, great, so that's everything I wanted to cover with you today. So I hope that was useful and good luck with applying this to your own data. All right, thanks.